issue, and I call the member for Wills. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. I'm pleased to support the amendment moved by the opposition, uh, and it's timely that we're having a, a discussion about employment participation. Uh, last Thursday, unemployment figures showed that a further 10,000 Australians had lost their jobs last month, and now over 742,000 Australians are out of work. The aggregate hours worked fell nearly 1 per cent, down 14 million hours. In my home state of Victoria, the participation rate fell from 64.8 per cent to 64.5 per cent, and our unemployment rate at 6.4 per cent is the worst since January 2002. In Broadmeadows, just north of my electorate, unemployment has risen by 25 per cent in the past six months, from 10.3 to 12.8 per cent. Unemployment across Glenroy, Hadfield and Faulkner in my electorate is of particular concern. It now sits at 6.9 per cent, higher than the national unemployment rate of 6 per cent and higher than the Victorian unemployment rate. And, uh, Deputy Speaker, this higher than average unemployment rate will not be helped with the loss of Ford and other manufacturers associated with that company. Qantas job losses will also affect this community because of its traditional employment links with Tullamarine Airport. Against this background, the decision of the federal government to allow employers to bring in unlimited numbers of foreign workers is a lunatic move which will cost Australian jobs and bring back the rorts which took place before that loophole was closed. We already have over one million temporary entrants in Australia who have work rights. It is plain crazy to increase the 457 visa program. This program is already way too high. In 2009-10, there were 68,457 visas granted. Last year, the figure had risen to over 126,000 temporary migrant worker visas. If you allow employers to bring in as many 457 workers as they like once a sponsorship is approved, this figure will continue to skyrocket. The workers concerned are prepared to work for less than Australian workers, which suits employers. But the 457 visa program is a dagger at the heart of Australian workers who end up working for less than decent wages and conditions or languishing indefinitely without any work at all. We need to cap and reduce the temporary migrant worker programs and give job opportunities and job security to young Australians. The temporary and permanent migrant worker programs are a recipe for more young Australians to be out of work with all the negative consequences that unemployment has in relation to mental health, drugs, crime and social harmony. I find it remarkable that uh, almost 750 occupations have so few Australian workers available that they're eligible for the 457 visa program. Caravan park managers, grape growers, cooks, IT workers, you name it, it's claimed that we're short of workers in that particular field, and it's just not so. Deputy Speaker, the ABC reporter Matt Peacock produced a very insightful piece of reporting on March the 6th about the ripping off of thousands of abattoir workers in Australia on working holiday or 417 visas. At the Scone Meatworks in the New South Wales Upper Hunter Valley, serious concerns have emerged about excessive hours of work, gross underpayments of pay and entitlements and mistreatment of employees, including sexual harassment. Grant Courtney from the Meatworkers Union Newcastle branch says that some of the international workers, often Taiwanese backpackers, are not even being paid half the Australian minimum wage. Investigations also revealed backpackers being encouraged not to pay tax by using ABN numbers. It is unacceptable that this can go on. A lot of this abuse of temporary workers occurs through labour hire companies. In the meat workers example, the Scone site is owned by Primo Australia, who used the labour hire company Scottwell International. It, in turn, recruited Chinese, Taiwanese, Japanese and Korean employees to work in abattoirs across Australia. Matt Peacock reported that it has 19 different abattoirs across three states, employing more than 1,100 people. And Grant Courtney from the Meat Workers Union says that these subcontracting arrangements and the use of labour agencies shouldn't happen. And I agree with him. It is a recipe for the kinds of abuses that Matt Peacock's report identified. The workers who come to Meatworks should be directly employed by the company 
they should be paid Australian wages and conditions, and they should pay Australian taxes. And if the work runs out, they can be let go the same as other workers are let go. And Deputy Speaker, furthermore, the Victorian Liberal government has written to the Commonwealth seeking to have the population threshold for regional migration agreements lifted to allow, of all places, Geelong to be included. The workers at Ford, Alcoa and other industries in Ge Geelong who now stand to lose their jobs are entitled to a fair crack at the jobs that will become available in future in that region without having to face ferocious competition for entry-level, low-wage jobs from foreign workers who are willing to work for much less. Now, the bill before the House is called the Social Security Legislation Incre Increased Employment Participation Bill. I am all in favour of increased employment participation, but we now have a workforce participation rate lower than it's been for years. In my home state of Victoria, we've got participation down from 64.8 to 64.5, with an unemployment rate uh, as bad as anything since January 2002. Unemployment in Broadmeadows has jumped 25 per cent in the six months of the Abbott government. Uh, so why on earth does the government want to increase the temporary migrant worker program instead of giving the unemployed people of Broadmeadows a go? Deputy Speaker, the December quarter figures showed that unemployment in the city of Moreland, which is in the heart of my electorate, has increased by over 25 per cent in just 12 months. Local unemployment has climbed from 4.1 per cent in December 2012 to 5.6 per cent in December 2013. 1,249 extra people in Moreland are now unemployed compared with 12 months ago. A total of 4,675 local people are now out of work. This increase has been across the board. Brunswick up from 3.6 to 5 per cent, Coburg up from 3.7 to 5 per cent and the north of Moreland up from 5.1 per cent to 6.9 per cent. As I said earlier, this figure covering Glenroy, Hadfield and Faulkner is of particular concern, being higher than the national unemployment rate and higher than the Victorian unemployment rate. And I'm dismayed that the federal and state governments have twiddled their thumbs as Holden, Toyota, Alcoa and Qantas have announced the sacking of thousands of workers. This will have adverse effects on my electorate and on Victorians more broadly. And this government's disdain for manufacturing in general and motor vehicle manufacturing in particular makes it not only an anti-South Australian government, as many South Australians made clear they've worked out on the weekend, but also an anti-Victorian government. Youth unemployment is a big issue for Australia and young Australians. According to a recent report by the Brotherhood of St Lawrence, youth unemployment has reached a crisis point. The organisation says the figures show an average of 12.4 per cent of young people between the ages of 15 and 24 were out of work in the year to January, and it says that that figure has topped 20 per cent in some parts of the country including Cairns in far north Queensland, west and northwest Tasmania and northern Adelaide. In the Hume region, north of my electorate, the rate has hit 17.5 per cent. And the executive director of the Brotherhood of St Lawrence, Tony Nicholson, has correctly, in my view, described the result as a disaster. And he says, what it means for all these young people is that they're at risk of never being able to get a foothold in the world of work. And in our modern economy, that means they're really being sentenced to a lifetime of poverty. And, and I think he's absolutely right, Deputy Speaker, and I think that uh, in many respects we are failing the younger generation in terms of housing affordability, uh, job security. We are letting them down. Uh, I'm very concerned about the loss of jobs since the new government came to office. The government has failed to support jobs. I'm concerned that they have little or no plans to deal with the increased unemployment. We've seen job losses announced at Qantas, 5,000 jobs, Toyota, 2,500 direct jobs, Holden, 2,900 direct jobs, Rio Tinto at the Gove refinery, 1,100 jobs, Electrolux in Orange, 544 jobs, uh, 110 jobs at Simplot, 200 jobs at Peabody, 200 jobs at Caterpillar, no doubt many other direct jobs. We, we all know, sadly, that these sorts of job losses have knock-on consequences and lead to more job losses. Australians deserve a government that will fight for jobs and support workers and job seekers. 
While measures to support young people in work are to be welcomed, and we do welcome them, we must focus on giving young people the skills and experience to get a job in the first place. And Tony Nicholson has called on the federal government to invest in a national strategy to turn things around. He says, overwhelmingly, we know that these young people need advice about their career paths. They need opportunities to gain basic skills. They need mentoring. But over and above all that, what they need is an opportunity to gain work experience in a real workplace with a real employer. Deputy Speaker, in government, Labor focused on supporting young people to finish school and get the training and higher education that they need for well-paying jobs. We believe in a strong public provider that underpins a high-quality VET system, which is why we support TAFE. Under Labor, we improve training and employment services for young people. Governments cannot expect young people to gain well-paid jobs without providing education, training and support. Governments cannot expect young people to easily find work with unemployment on the increase in the way that I've outlined to the House. And I think that we should be looking to the Scandinavian models for guidance. There, an emphasis is placed on the long term, with policies in place to mitigate the harsher effects of capitalism. Denmark, for example, has a system of flex security, which makes it easier for employers to sack people, but it provides support and training for the unemployed. An active labour market policy in Nordic countries helps improve qualifications among the unemployed through courses and education and also encourages the unemployed to actively focus on job seeking. The social security net is not passive in the sense that people may choose freely between working or not. Rather, it provides a secure income as long as the demand for active participation in the labour market is met. Deputy Speaker, Participation in the labour market is also supported by welfare schemes such as childcare. An extensive childcare system has a direct welfare effect for families and helps to socialise children. It also helps to ensure gender equality in terms of opportunities to participate in the labour market. Regrettably, we have a government which obsessively believes in self-correcting free markets and that workers who have lost their jobs can move seamlessly into other work at the same time they disparage welfare and they talk up the various myths of neoliberal economic doctrine. But the welfare state in Nordic countries, however, is considered to be a strength when it comes to economic development. Not only does the welfare state benefit the whole population, but it also has a positive effect on the economy. The public sector and welfare services have helped these countries to develop a highly skilled workforce and a high level of employment. Uh, Norway, for example, has 3.3 per cent unemployment, where we have six. This, combined with a stable civil society, a strong democratic tradition and an effective regulatory framework, has led to the emergence in the region of extensive social capital, one of the main pillars of the Nordic economies. Deputy Speaker, I support the opposition's amendment. I urge the government to get fair income about boosting the labour force participation rate. To do this, it needs to cut back its migrant worker programs. It's the smaller economies of Northern Europe that haven't been trying to boost population growth with high migration programs that have most successfully had high labour force participation rates. I urge the government to support Australian jobs. I urge it to support Australian young people who I fear are being done a real disservice by the policies that we are pursuing now. And I commend the amendment to the House. I thank the member for Wills. The question now is 